and me and uh, George Ortega, we haven't spoken before, so this is our first uh, chance to mess with the subject. And so, uh, George, would you like to say something about yourself, explain your mission on the subject of free will? All right. Um, I've been trying to, like, get people to understand we have a free will for, like, over a decade. Um, I first started at, at Pal Talk. I had, like, a username, Blisser, and, like, I even... I used to go to the atheist rooms there and just like explain it to them. That was, that was around 2006, 2007. Then uh, most recently, I, I live like close to Manhattan, so I started this meetup in Manhattan, uh, Exploring Illusion of Free Will, like in April 2010. So we've been going for like four years, and then like about a year later, I started this TV show here in White Plains, Exploring Illusion of Free Will. And we're up to like episode 170, and we just basically put out the videos trying to describe why free will is an illusion, why it matters to know this. I published a couple of books. I got a website exploring illusion of free will, uh, causalconsciousness.com, and um, I think we're making progress. It's going to take a while, but it, it, you know, it's been good so far. I think. Yeah, well, it is. A, it's a, I, I consider it one of the more my more difficult subjects, just because you can say cause and effect forever, and then people will just make up some invisible crickets or some kind of thing that made somebody do something, and and so you're kind of defeated because they can always just come up with some sort of extraneous quantum cause or some kind of nonsense, and so you're just stuck with a, 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 this idea. And and I and I guess for, for both of us, we'd understand that the idea that we're a you a person is sort of an illusion, right? I mean, it's the brain that creates you. And so I sort of call consciousness, we're just witnessing ourselves. Our will is something we witness. We don't really make it. We watch ourselves do stuff. And we really don't have anything to say about it. Our brain, I mean, my brain just made this sentence, right? Absolutely. You know, I didn't do it. My brain did it. Yeah, and um, you know, so, um, so you said it right. Some, sometimes people will try to say, well, no, not everything's caused. You know, quantum mechanics is, like, probabilistic or random and stuff. And, I mean, like, I try to explain to them, hey, that doesn't help. I mean, <laughs> if our decisions are not caused, you know, we can't attribute them to ourselves, you know, what, however you want to define ourself, right? I mean, like, so, I mean, basically the, the argument for free will is incoherent. It's just it's self-defeating. Well, even the word free, I also have a big problem with because, you know, traditionally free is always tied to some opposite restriction. You know, you free a slave, you free a prisoner, you liberate something from a binding. So what is the binding that we're being liberated from? I mean, you're obviously not going to be liberated from your desire. If somebody puts a piano on your foot, um, you're going to be pretty harshly compelled to get that piano off your foot, and all the freedom in the world isn't going to help you. Oh, yeah, and like we've known this since grade school. I mean, like, we're taught in school, you know, human behavior, animal behavior is nature and nurture, environment, genetics. There's no room there for free will. It's like we, we understand this. Yeah, uh, and I guess it's just an ego thing. People are just uncomfortable with the idea of declaring themselves a programmed computer because, you know, that's sort of humiliating, okay? Yes, okay, we're just, we're just programs. You know, I'm running Windows, you're running Bindos. You know, you're, you're a loser, loser -o. You know, I'm winner-o. Um, you know, and so you're just comparing software now, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think people want to think they're more special than the software that they're running. Well, I address that in two ways. Like, for naturalist scientists, basically, you know, this chain of cause and effect goes back to the Big Bang. So basically, we're manifesting the universal will. Okay, that's one way to see it. Or if you're religious, I mean, 80% 80, 80 of, of people here in the United States are religious. So, like, I try to appeal to them also. So if they want to think of it in terms of theological constructs, whatever, we are manifesting God's will. So either way, whether it's um, universal will or God's will, that kind of like elevates our our existence to you know to something much more than just a human being. So, yeah, well, that's another way I've thought of the question. You know, is I would just put it to somebody who's believing in God. You know, what well, what's God's will? I mean, where does that come from? So he sits around forever, and then one day he decides to make humans. I mean, it just occurs to him like in his will. It just I was here forever for a zillion, billion, zillion years, and then one day I decided, oh yeah, let's do this human thing. 
I mean, what did his, what did, what conformed his will? Where did he get the idea from? And it's more than that. If, if we attribute omniscience or all-knowingness to God, if he knew a billion years ago what he'd be doing today, even God lacks free will today. So he's, he's as much a robot or a puppet as we are. Well, he obviously has a motivation. At least the Christian God, you'd have to say he was motivated by some personal ambition. You know, he had some sort of idolatry in his own head that he wanted something to, you know, bow to him and pray to him and love him and all that stuff. So he seems like he has some issues that he was addressing, and he doesn't seem like he was free of those issues. Right, and, and whether you want to attribute causality to us as human beings or as God, or God, the same, the same illogic basic phenomenon happens. Basically, like this causal chain that stretches back to before the Big Bang, because we know we don't know what happened, but like logically, it stretches back indefinitely. That also applies to God. So we never get to a point where we or God decided anything. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, we could argue the whole infinity argument forever, but I, I tend to think that time runs out. You know what I mean? Like there was a place where time didn't exist because matter didn't have distance, and therefore there was no place for time to exist. So, um, I, but you're, obviously you could stay in a forever state of nothing. You know what I mean? No movement would be, you know, but you could do that forever because there's no time. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, you know. To my mind, it, it, it transcends logic. It, it's beyond our ability to understand something. Uh, well, it is, a, it is an, a, 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 a black hole of contemplation. I mean, you'll never get out of it once you go in it. You'll never be able to unravel the you know, layers of the onion, so to speak. You'll just end up at the core every time you, you'll spin around and just keep ending up back in the beginning. Yep. Yeah. All right, so at least we agree on that. I did. I did watch a few of your videos, and one of them you did end it with a statement that you sort of do believe in God, but I guess it's a pantheist type God, right? It's the net net composition of the universe kind of God. Yeah, if, if, if the universe is everything and God is everything, then God is universe. If the if God is all powerful, God is the laws of nature. I mean, it's yeah. Well, so I, see, I might it might be a semantics argument, but I would almost argue that just as I think it's as important for people to let go of free will, I think it's sort of important for them to go. Of this idea of a designer or a creator or you know a mission statement there's clearly not a mission statement um, you know it's crude forces all the way down and you know and we're just uh, we're we're an eddy in the stream right a simple function right water going downhill can create very complex patterns in the water but that complexity doesn't mean anything it just is a consequence of friction and when you build up energy it spins around in circles and does funky things. I think um, because I'm a person, because we're people, I think therefore I, I prefer to personify reality, you know, re re relate to, to nature, to the universe as a, a person rather than a thing. Um, when, when we talk about not having free will, some very interesting um, implications arise. For example, if you do something intelligent, you know, we'll label it intelligent, whatever it might be, you might say something intelligent, right? But you don't have a free will, that intelligent act, statement, thought cannot be attributed to you, so it has to be attributed to this universal causal chain. So in other, in other yeah. words... I don't even think you have to go back to the universe to find that relationship. Clearly, I have... You know, I've sort of had this philosophical discussion with people, and it's like we can't really change ourselves, but we really can change other people. So I, it's easier for me to affect you than it is for me to affect me. You know, I can have more of an impact on you than I can on myself because of this whole, the fact that we are just these reflexive organisms. I can add something that you don't have, um, you know, much easier to you than I can do anything to change me. Well, I'm not sure I understand that, but either way, you know, whether you're changing me or yourself, I mean, none of it is up to us. That's that's the interesting fact. I mean, we're just well, like we're all byproduct, and we're byproduct of the environment that has interacted with us. So the things that have dented us have made us. So in that sense, we're not we we can't take credit for what we are because we're sort of the 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 reflexive reaction of the world that banged us into shape. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, but I'd say the blame is sort of irrelevant to me. I mean, I don't, you know, blame or credit. And, and so there's many people that take this free will argument to some sort of argument that 
um, well, if there's no free will, then everybody's off the hook for being a jerk. And I would sort of argue that, no, you can still be defined as dysfunctional or broken or useless or stupid or, you know, we can still call you some nasty names um, even if we're not blaming you. Yeah, well, the, the issue of blame has implications beyond our personal self. I mean, I just published a book in April, Free Will, Its Refutation, Societal Cost, and Role in Climate Change Denial. I mean, Pew Research did a, um, a survey earlier this year and found 66% of Americans are in denial that climate change is happening and that we're causing it. All right, so when you understand what denial is, it's a psychological defense mechanism that works unconsciously that's a response to being blamed for something. So in other words, like without the free will construct, these people would be able to not blame themselves for what we're doing to the planet, perhaps look at the evidence objectively, and maybe we can start like making some progress on it. So like this <clears> issue of, of like our not having a free will has vast implications that, that so far aren't really acknowledged or recognized that much. Well, I, I, I certainly can appreciate the fact that it would, it would put logic as a higher premium because you're basically saying what's the best or the rightest program. You know, you could, you could basically say that we are programming and you're basically just going to make a comparison about what program gets the job done the most efficiently. You know, so you could basically critique people for being too high maintenance and you could critique people for being wasteful and all of that kind of thing just because their programming isn't making them very functional. They're basically a lemon and uh, we should go with a different model. <laughs> we should invest in a better model, let's say. Right. I mean, what, I, what I'm saying, though, is like, you know, the reason these people can't look at the evidence is because they're blaming themselves. You know, if a scientist tells them, you know, like, you, because of your free will, are endangering civilization on the planet, you know, lives of your children, grandchildren, great children, they can't handle it. If, if they didn't believe in free will, they wouldn't feel indicted. So, yes, I, you're right. I mean, we're still going to, like, uh, hold on to blame and guilt and, and we're going to, like, feel good about the things we do. But we have to see it in the right way. We have to understand that, no, that's, that's actually just an illusion. Nothing is up to us. And that way we can start seeing reality as it truly is. Yeah, I guess that would still leave them in the, 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 with an ego deficit problem where they'd have to concede their Windows 95. And, you know, you know what I'm saying. They'd still have to concede they're a clunker. And, and they'd still want to avoid having that designation placed on them and they'll still come up with rationalizations to say no I'm a perfectly good operating system I'm doing perfectly fine so uh, you know I, I guess it, it it's a semantics argument again where I don't think it'll probably change the fact that too many people are too nihilistic and too selfish and they don't want to hear any part of the truth that doesn't have something to do with what they get you know when I when I started doing the shows I thought that people would get it much more clearly and strongly than they have I thought that people would be ashamed to not understand this, this simple principle of causality. What I've realized is, yeah, human beings, not just the average person, but academics are really, really not very intelligent. I mean, they, they don't know how to think. And yeah, I, I think sometimes maybe like people need to be shamed into understanding that because there's a lot of like academic arrogance out there. People think they know stuff when all they do is they learn something, they remember it, they recite it for a test, and sometimes they apply it, they think they're intelligent. We're living in a very unintelligent world. Yeah, and it, it clings, too. I guess that's part of this free will argument, too. It clings to the old knowledge, the old perceptions, and it just doesn't want to be forced out of the box of those comfortable notions. And, you know, it just doesn't want to accept the fact that there's this linear line of intelligence and it moves in a direction and you're going to go there anyway. You can't stop it. You're not going to stop the airplane. You're not going to stop certain things. And it's like they just keep resisting because they don't want that clinical truth. They don't want that cold water of evolution and big bangs and cause and effect. And, you know, that's just too much cold water for them. And you can explain it because, I mean, we're hardwired. One, the reason we don't have one way of explaining why we don't have a free will is because we're hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. We're hedonic creatures, so it's very understandable that when people are telling um, the average person, no, you know, nothing's up to you, you're just a robot, a computer, you know, people aren't going to want to accept that. You kind of like, what I've been struggling with is a way to make that reality more 
more acceptable to people, you know. But but yeah, until they, they find a way to say, hey, fine, you know, like my life still has meaning, then they're not going to believe it. They're not going to. They're going to choose not to understand it because that they're programmed that way. Well, that's always, I think, one of these things about science and, and logic and stuff is there's this argument about a flower. You know, you can look at a flower as an aesthetic thing, or as a scientist, you could dissect it and pick it apart. And there's this argument, like Feynman used to make this, the physicist, you know, that there's a great beauty in this dissection. You will find new avenues of magnificence and beauty in the structure of the compounds and the molecules and you know, it's that kind of thing I like looking in the universe, and you can find great beauty in doing that. And it's like they're not appreciating the fact that they're, yeah, this isn't hostile to your sensibilities to recognize how magnificent a logic machine we have and that we can use it to do logic. It's a really good computer. Being a computer is not a bad thing. We can be really good at it. You know, and instead they want to be a monkey and they want to just use the brain as a hammer. You know, they just want to, they just want to scheme comfort and they don't want to do that big picture vision thing. Yeah, it's beyond that. It's like, it seems they're not really interested in the truth. You know, they would prefer to live in an illusion. I mean, like 50% of Americans b believe in creationism. They, they still don't accept evolution. You know, I mean, like, so yeah, we're not, you know... We say we value the truth. And, well, the irony that. is, is I don't even think they believe in it, right? So it's like I don't, I don't think they would invest ten dollars of their hard-earned money in the theory. You know what I'm saying? They just like it because it sounds good, all right? But you can see how easily they sin, and you're saying, well, you know, if they really believed in this God, they wouldn't be taking a chance on eternal damnation, <laughs> you know, for these petty crimes, eternal damnation. So, you know, the depth of their faith is is almost mockable and um, you know it only comes out when it's time to propagandize you know when it's time to you know do the marching band thing then they'll have all this rhetoric when it's and when especially when they're giving away somebody else's rights right if they can sacrifice your rights on the altar of their god yeah they have no problem with that <laughs> yeah because that doesn't hurt them any right I hear you and I, I think this this threat of hell I think is another reason why so many people who believe in God who are conventionally religious can't get it. Because, I mean, at five-year-old, they're probably to being told by a minister or priest or their parents, listen, if you don't believe what we do, you're going to, you know, spend the rest of, of eternity in a really, really horrible place. Well, when, I know there would be this logical argument that you could say that, you know, if they're going to have this silly God anyway that's playing this game with us, right? He doesn't tell us about microbes, and he doesn't tell us anything, and he forces us to do all this learning ourselves. You could almost say that maybe he just made up the whole hell thing, right, just to deter us from being bad, right? So in, so he's not really going to do it. These would be stupid, right? Us as logical people could know there's no point in torturing somebody after the fact, right? It's not going to make the victims whole. So what's the point of torturing somebody except for deterrence? And obviously when everything's done and finished, there's no point in having deterrence anymore. So why wouldn't you just let everybody out of hell anyway? Well, that, that makes sense, but, but, you know, these people aren't really guided by sense. Uh, the, the term free will was coined, it's not even in the Bible, I, you probably know that. You know, the word, the, the, the concept free will is not there. Um, St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, this, this guy, 380 AD, he's grappling, he's like saying, well, you know, there's evil on the planet, right? And God is all good. Now, he could have blamed this concept, this, this creature they created called Satan or Lucifer or whatever. He could have said, well, you know, evil is, is his fault and all, but he chose to blame us. That, that's how this whole free will mess, you know, started. Well, that, that might be a good metaphor to discuss is because you could say a movie like Star Wars doesn't have, like, it has a concept of, of will being altered by the dark force are, you know, the light force, right? So the force would somehow affect your will. So if you, you know, if you went with the dark force, you would become evil, you know, and if you went with the light force, you would be good. And so instead of it being an overt, um, you know, enhancement of your will, it's this idea of some force that you flow with, you know. Well, exactly. And like, all right, I try, I tell people, listen, yeah, like you were saying before, 
we don't have a free will, but that doesn't mean we can do whatever we want, you know, because like our actions have consequences, either helpful or harmful. And so we recognize that, but we can recognize that and live that way without the free will construct. I mean, Einstein didn't believe in free will. You know, there's a lot of like great minds who didn't believe in free will. They did a lot of great things. I mean, you don't yeah, have. Yeah, we know. We know what really causes people to add, act badly, and we know it's just a horrible ignorance or a horrible selfishness. You know, and a lack of appreciation. So they basically can't add two plus two. You know what I mean? They can't see my pain as having any value, and they can see their own welfare as see having extreme value. And that simple illogic is where they fail. So it's like if you had a calculator and the calculator couldn't add 2 plus 2, you would say, well, I should, you know, I'm not going to use this to do calculations, right? Maybe it could make toast, but I'm not going to use it as a calculator, and maybe we should be thinking in terms of, like, you know, people have to meet a certain competency standard, and you can call them a jerk if they can't figure out it's not a good idea to smash somebody in the head with a brick and steal their money. Exactly. I mean, again, consequences, rules, laws, they still say, say the same. I think it would be a bit more compassionate because, for example, like, you know, if somebody does something horrible, the newspaper is like, you know, rotten hell. I mean, all this hate is encouraged. I mean, yeah, we got to protect people. we got to protect society. But the free will belief just encourages us to go at each other, to just hate each other and blame each other in a way that without it, we'd be, like, much more intelligently compassionate, understanding, you know. Forgive yeah, to yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the, um, you know, I sort of see it as more of a cause and effect argument in the sense that, you know, you do have to create deterrence. And, yeah. and that's just the fact that deterrence works because it is cause and effect. Okay, so, you know, you have to create this idea that there's an implication, a very bad implication to, for bad behavior because our nature is kind of selfish and lousy. You know, we are kind of scheming, selfish bastards. And the only thing that really can shape us up sometimes is the fact that, yeah, there's something bad's going to happen to me if I do bad. Absolutely. But like the idea is like, all right, we have a model for this. Um, operant conditioning in psychology. It doesn't judge the person. It just knows that like, if you want a person to act in a certain way, you either give a person rewards for that or you threaten punishment. That's, that's, that's all we are. We're... we're, we're Organisms were beings that respond to reward and punishment. So, like, if you, if you get rid of the blame, then, I mean, a lot of people, like, they don't have very good self-concepts. You know, they don't have very good concepts of other people. To the extent that we get rid of this belief in free will, it's like, it's like absolution. I mean, it's like innocence. I mean, we're all, yeah, we may be screwed up in a lot of ways, but it's not our fault. That's a gift. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm always saying as a political pragmatist, I would argue that there's only so much resource in the world, and so in a way, I'm almost like saying, if you, if you have a toaster and the toaster can't toast, you know, the toaster's trying to burn your house down, you unplug it and you throw it out and you buy a new toaster. And so I'm sort of of the opinion that, you know, the broken, I have nothing malicious against them, but I also have no obligation to sustain them. I have no obligation to let them parasitically, you know, infect the social organism and 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 break its legs. So, you know, part of me wants to say, you know, obviously there's a limit to how draconian you can get, but yeah, I really don't have an obligation to spend a bunch of resources to rehabilitate people that are just profoundly stupid. Yeah, we're, we're not, you know, it's not like we're going to um, do away with, with judgment. I mean, uh, the thing is, though, like, for example, like, you have, like, a criminal or suspect. He's in police custody. You've got this good cop, bad cop strategy. The, the bad cop is just, like, threatening, you know, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. I mean, like, you know, just really, really laying into the person. The good cop says, listen, I understand. I understand what you went through and all. You know, um, I, in, in your situation, I would have done the same thing. And through that strategy, because it is a strategy that they use for purpose, the suspect or the criminal suddenly begins to cooperate more because he understands that he's being understood. So in other words, like, so yeah, we don't let people off the hook, but the way we treat them, for, even like when you call somebody a criminal, you know, somebody like really evil, they see themselves as that way. If society is calling them that, that's how they're going to see themselves, and it's much harder for them to rehabilitate themselves. To, yeah, to stop well, I guess I'm still going to think, I'm still going to argue that if you have a calculator that can't add 2 plus 2, it's way too broken 
to try to mess with it. Okay, it's just it's not a simple problem. And when when these people are this disconnected from reality, I mean, like I said, I mean, these are people that will bash you in the head with a brick and steal ten dollars. I mean, that kind of insane behavior. I mean, in terms of logic, it just doesn't make any sense. There's just no way you can see me as meaningless. Okay, you have to do some awful bizarre thinking to think it's meaningless that you're going to bash me in the head with a brick. And, and somebody that broken, I'm almost saying, well, if they don't get it, if it's not obvious to them that what they're doing is way out of line, then, then yeah, I'm just saying too broken. I don't well, even want to have a conversation with them. I'm just saying it's like a rabid dog, you know, just find a nice way to put it out of its misery. Well, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, I think that logic, that, that statement, that pronouncement applies to the human race. Because, I mean, if, if we're not intelligent enough to understand this simple concept of causality, and if we're not intelligent enough to understand what we're doing to the planet, to the climate at all, you know, I think that like maybe, yeah, maybe we've had our time here. <laughs> maybe well, 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 I am an anti-natalist and, and worse, so I mean, I, I actually would vote for it, okay? I would vote for nuking it from space, okay? Because, yeah, there's nothing good happening on this planet, but that is a separate subject, so let's not go there. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, they're they're you know in in a sense that's where the logic points. You know, is that we are just kind of creating problems and then cleaning up half the mess, and people just don't want to see themselves as mess makers. You know, this is part of this whole argument is that they have to they have to glorify the mission statement, and the mission statement be, seems to be I want to win. Okay, <laughs> I mean I want give, give me some more lottery tickets because I want to win, and they really can't see any further than that. Yeah, I hear you. I think maybe the free will construct, the belief feeds into that, because, like, why do you want to win? Because it's you, right? You can credit yourself. I mean, like, you feel really good about yourself and all. So to the extent that we move beyond that and, like, yeah, whether we win or lose, it's just not us. It's, like, it's luck, it's fate, whatever. Then we can, you know, be less competitive, be maybe more just, like, comfortable with reality, just live instead of, like, constantly striving, you know? Well, it's, it's exactly, this argument's really about the difference between bad will and good will, you know, and just having a conversation about the fact that we would expect people to be able to say something like, okay, if somebody has to have a broken leg, it really doesn't matter whether it's you or me. I mean, I can say i rather it be you, but I can't say it rationally like you should have the broken leg, right? I mean, your pain and suffering is just as meaningful as my pain and suffering, and so logically I could understand that you know even though viscerally and emotionally I don't like the idea okay because no I don't want to have the broken leg because I'm a selfish bastard but the fact is I can understand that it's not going to make a difference that it's going to be a person suffering and it really doesn't matter who what their name is and that's the key that's the key to the, to, to the extent we understand that when people do something wrong when they're suffering stuff it's not their fault yeah, we're not going to let them, you know, have a free pass. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to be compassionate. We're going to say, yeah, like this unfortunate guy, you know, the universe made him do something really, really stupid, really criminal. He's, you know, we can't allow that to happen. But we can feel some kind of empathy for him while we're like, right, you know. Right. Well, see, this would be the ideal circumstance. Let's say somebody had a stick in their brain, you know, like the lion with a paw, you know, stuck thorn in its paw. But let's say they had a stick in their brain, and that's what made them do all the stupid stuff. And all I had to do was pull the stick out. Yeah, I'd give that guy a free ride. I'd say, oh, okay, we get it, okay? It was just a stick in your head. No problem. We can fix that, you know? But you, some, I'm just saying that the real problem with some of these people is that they are so fundamentally, emotionally incapable of even having a logical discussion about reality because they're just so nihilistic and self-focused that they can't even see the rest of the humans as humans. You know what I mean? They're just things that they get what they want from. You know, they're just things to use. And it's not its not just for their benefit, because you're right. I mean, we can't allow people to just, like, get off the hook, you know, when they do what they do. But, like, for us, I mean, like, hatred, this kind of, like, contempt for people, that's not a great feeling. And sometimes we can enjoy it a bit, but it's, it's not ennobling. You know, it doesn't, like, tap into our highest selves. So that to, the, to the extent that we can free ourselves from that, we're freeing ourselves to, like, enjoy our lives a lot more. Well, yeah, I, I call it uh, separating philosophy from psychology. You know, like we can indulge our psychology, we can talk all kinds of crap, 
but let's do that when we're just talking crap and we're going to have a serious conversation well you can't talk crap anymore all right you can't talk from your emotions anymore you got to talk from something called logic and evidence and that's where you know it all gets very fuzzy is people are confusing psychology with philosophy and they're not the same thing well this my work over the last four years on this issue um, made me realize that more than I dreamed imaginable I mean I, I ultimately started reading this book by Chris Mooney the Republican brain where basically explains that yeah on issues on political issues we don't we don't vote we don't decide what our position is based on the evidence we decide on based based on what we need to, to have you know the reality be I mean we're not logical creatures fundamentally we're like we're so like entrapped with this with, with these needs and desires these emotional needs and desires these psychological things that they're actually program it's another example of why we don't have free will you know yeah. well it's, it's the power of the emotions and you know because like I, I find that self obnoxious to myself is that here I am and calling myself an intellectual or at least somebody can have a reasonable philosophical conversation but I can still see the selfish monkey you know what I mean the self I can still see the games my my psychology is playing in terms of ego advantage and whether I look better or like I look smarter or I do you know and I can see that all happening and it's embarrassing that my brain is still doing that I've informed it that that's silly and it's still doing it I hear you. So, like, I mean, like, we we like to, you know, my other gig is I do happiness. I did a happiness show. I run about 20 happiness meetups in Manhattan. So, one of the things about happiness, we like to like ourselves, right? To the extent we don't have to blame ourselves for not being the kind of people we'd, we'd rather be, that's going to help us. You know, I mean, like, it's it, we accept ourselves. Fine. We, we do some good things. We do some bad things. We just, understanding we don't have a free will makes it a lot easier for us to like ourselves. And, and that's big. Yeah, I, I have the opposite kind of perception. I would, I would probably create the guilt club, you know, <laughs> and people with sticks, and just they bash it into them that they suck so bad and that they have no right to want anything because they're just so evil and nasty, and they all should be sitting in the corner, and uh, they should be ashamed of themselves forever because they can't even make up for all their past crime. Yeah, I would just be beating them up so bad because yeah, they're. Their egos are out of control. You know, the human ego is just—it's way out of control. That—that's the approach that I take on some of my episodes toward the academics. These guys—I mean—they've got PhDs. They're supposed to understand how to think object objectively, you know, and they don't. I mean, they're clueless. So yeah, I think sometimes people need to be shamed into getting their minds to work. I hear you. Yeah, well, that, and they've objectively uh, annihilated the existence of consciousness as a significant event in the universe. That's all I see them doing. You know what I mean? They're coming up with these bizarre rationalizations to say suffering doesn't matter. And you're like, to me. <laughs> and you're like, well, what do you mean, to you? Okay, it doesn't matter whether it matters to you or not. Come on. It just the point is, is whether it's a significant event. You can't even acknowledge that. So they're almost like criminals. They're exactly. almost talking the criminals talk which is yeah my consciousness is important but I don't know about the rest of you you know I hear you I hear you. it's really competitive yeah so let's see if we can come up something circular to, to uh, you know come around to an ending here um, you, know, because, you know it's the Big Bang right the Big Bang made us do it right so all of this is the realization of you know photons that have been buzzing around for 15 billion years and here they did they smashed us together at this moment to have this conversation and uh, you know that's not good enough for people right that's not a big enough story to impress them they have to add a bunch of cartoon characters yeah my, again I think my experience is they're afraid of like if they don't believe that they have a free will they're afraid they're condemned to hell for the rest of eternity <laughs> they gotta get over that fear yeah well, I don't think that yeah I think it's more of just the ego thing I just think they don't like the idea of being called a computer That's a, yeah. full of cruddy software <laughs> you know they just don't want to take account for that that they they're, they're they are a thing and that's what they are they want to pretend they're unicorn riding or something, you know, with their unicorn riders. And like theologically, I mean, it's idolatry. Think about it. Like they hold God to be sovereign, all powerful, right? Well, if God is all powerful, 
then like what God says goes. That means like if we're attributing some power to ourselves, it's like we're making ourselves into God. So they don't even understand how they're contradicting their own beliefs by believing free will. Yeah, and obviously the cause and effect part comes in where you say something like, well, how do you even explain the Native Americans? You know, they, they were supposed to figure out Jesus on their own. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, were, they were supposed to like freely will themselves to be good Christians when they didn't even know what a Christian was. Right. Yeah. But again, it, it, all, it all goes back to this simple concept. Everything has a cause. And if, if, you know, some people misinterpret quantum mechanics to, to believe that some things are not caused, that doesn't help free will either. And that's, that's the entirety of it. The, there's no action mechanism that explains free will. It's completely incoherent. Right. It's like, look, it's, I, here's another quick analogy, okay? I mean, you have to practice to be a good baseball player or a good basketball player or to do anything with any kind of skill. And life is the same story. You've got to practice. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand the physics, and you gotta understand the dynamic, and you gotta understand yourself and your role you're playing in. You gotta understand the boundaries and the foul lines, and you know, or you're not gonna play a very good game, are you? And so there's a lot of people who have no clue what court they're on, you know, and they're just bouncing the ball, and that's why it all goes wrong, is because they're just ignorant. They're not very good players. And that's another reason why it's important to overcome this illusion of free will, because under the free will belief, we just do things because we want to, right? I mean, because we want to and then it ends there. When we understand, no, we don't have a free will, we do things for reasons. And once we understand that, we start looking for the reasons. We start looking for the causes. And that's where thinking and science begins. Yeah, well, exactly. You've got to understand something to have compassion. You've got to understand to have empathy. You've got to understand to do the right thing. And to say that people can do the right thing without understanding doesn't make any sense. <laughs> All right. Well, it's really good talk, George. Let's do it again someday. And, uh, you know, um, really appreciate it. It's a good conversation. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yep. Okay. We'll catch Take you care. again. You too. Bye.